Hello and welcome to Heat Geek. I can't do this, it's stupid. Stupid idea. Fucking stupid idea. Hi, I'm Adam. Today I'm going to talk about low loss headers, why to use them, where to use them, and why not to use them. I get it. We all want some awesome pictures for social media under a headline saying what a good job we've done for a customer. And 99% of the time, we are doing an awesome job for our customers. But putting a low-loss header and three additional pumps on a 20 kilowatt system doesn't necessarily constitute doing a good job for your customer. In fact, it could be a worse job with less efficiency. Okay, so let's quickly break down why we use low-loss headers. So the first place we use low-loss headers is where our system flow rate exceeds the maximum permissible flow rate through our boiler. That is, for example, when we're using underfloor heating, you need a much faster flow so you've got an even temperature across the floor. However, that flow may be faster than the boiler manufacturer will allow through their boiler. Could be for noise or various other reasons. Or the boiler pump might not just be able to get up to that speed. The second reason is that the boiler pump hasn't got enough energy left over once it's circulated the boiler. If there's not enough energy left over, it's not going to be able to get to the furthest radiator or the emitter with the most resistance in that circuit. Consult the boiler manufacturer's instructions, all this information's in there. However, since boilers have started using ERP pumps, typically the boiler pumps are seven meter head pumps, which means they're really more than ample for most domestic situations. So you don't really need hydraulic separation in most circumstances, except for underfloor. But there are other ways to get around that. So let me show you what I mean. Okay. So when we have a boiler and we have whatever emitters over here, if this pump here isn't, isn't powerful enough once it's circulated the boiler to reach over here, then you need to add another pump over here. Or your flow rate over here is faster than what this can produce. You'll need to add a low loss header. And all a low loss header is a hydraulic brake. So here's an oversized low loss header which is essentially a big empty tube. The water comes in here. If this pump wasn't on, this water would just circulate round this tube because from the water to get from here to here is a much more simple path than it to go through here when this pump isn't on. So that pump can just pump round that circuit. The water's taking the path of least resistance and coming back to itself. And the same for this pump. If this pump wasn't on, it would go around the least resistance and circulate on its own. And this way the pumps don't interfere with each other. That way you can tailor the secondary pump to the flow requirement of the secondary circuit or put in the additional pump you need. If you don't add a low loss header and just connected the pipework straight up, then if the flow required from this emitter was faster than what was permissible through the boiler, it would just drag through the boiler. If the reason you added a secondary pump, however, is that it couldn't reach the furthest radiator, then if you're putting two modulating pumps in series this way, they'll begin to fight each other. So this pump will modulate, which will change the reading as at this pump, which will cause that to modulate, and they'll oscillate between each other, back and forth, back and forth, which will damage the pumps. So we add hydraulic separation. The other benefit you get is, because flow through Lola setters is so low due to their size, is that you get very good dirt separation and air separation. So as water comes in from the secondary circuit, dirt will drop to the bottom, it's not getting rushed around the system, and air will separate out and come out of your vent at the top. And the last advantage is pump energy. By splitting your system into two halves like this, the combined energy required to power this pump and to power this pump is actually less than if you had one pump powering the whole system. And that's due to what's known in engineering as the square rule, which we will go into in another video. So why not put a low loss header on every job? And the answer to that is distortion. One of the best things you can do when you're designing and commissioning a system is to make the boiler as cool as possible and the system ideally. The benefits of that are we get added condensing and extraction of latent heat, get more efficient heat transfer, more efficient combustion, lower flue gas losses because we're not blowing warm air outside or as warm air, 
Lower corrosion rates, it's more gentle on the boiler because the boiler is not going hot, cold, hot, cold, which is known as thermal stress. It's more gentle than the boiler's expansion vessel because that's not getting hot, cold, hot, cold, and it's not having to work as much because the water's not expanding as much. It reduces pump cavitation on the boiler pump, and the condensate also cleans the heat exchanger, which again helps with heat transfer, and slows down the necessity for servicing. So what do I mean by distortion? Well, the problem is, in this system here, we have two pumps that are working on different parameters. The boiler pump is what's known as burner linked. And a burner linked pump varies the pressure output to maintain a set speed. The reason it targets speed is so it can maintain dead delta T20. The system pump, however, varies the speed to target a set pressure output. So you have a boiler pump that's varying the pressure output to target speed and a system pump that varies speed to target pressure output. And what that leaves you with is differing flow rates either side of the hydraulic separation. So if we take an example here, if this was a 28 kilowatt system and a 28 kilowatt system boiler, if we use mass flow rate, again I'll do a video on mass flow rate another time, we'll know that the boiler is going to target around 20 litres a minute to maintain delta T20. Now, if our secondary side was running at, for example's sake, 40 litres a minute, what we get is 20 litres a minute of 70 degree water here. Remember the boiler's targeting a delta of 20, so it's got 50 degree return. If this is going over people's heads, this is all going to be covered in later videos. So 20 litres a minute is going to be going straight across here and straight into, and straight into the flow pipe on the secondary side. However, because it's calling for 40 litres a minute, it needs an additional 20 litres a minute, which will take from its own return. So if we have 20 litres a minute at 70 degrees and 20 litres a minute at 50 degrees, because that's a, that's a return temperature, you're going to have an average flow temperature of 60 degrees. Your average emitter temperature is halfway between 50 and 60 degrees, which is 55 degrees and your average boiler temperature is 60 degrees. So this boiler is running five degrees hotter than it would do if it was directly connected to the emitter. Conversely, for argument's sake, if this side was running at, say, 10 litres a minute, what you would end up with is 10 litres a minute coming in from the boiler at 70, and 10 litres a minute going straight into its own return. And what you have on this side is 10 litres a minute of 70 degree water. Now there's a couple of ways you can work this out. You can use mass flow rate to work out what the temperature would be, the temperature drop would be on the secondary side. Or you could say, well, if that needs 10 litres a minute from at 70 degrees, what temperature would this 10 litres a minute need to be from here in order to get 50 degree return temperature? Well, it would be the same distance from there to there from 70 to 50 as it would be from here to here. So this return must be 30. The average of 70 and 30 added together is 50 degrees. And the result is that your mean radiator temperature is 50 degrees. So in this example, this is literally twice as bad. The average temperature of the emitter is 50 degrees and the average temperature of the boiler is 60 degrees. So now the boiler is running twice as hot as it needs to. So why don't we just set this up at the beginning so they're perfectly balanced and then there won't be a problem, right? Well, unfortunately it's not that easy. So if we take this system again, 28 kilowatts, just rub out all of this. If we balance this side to 20 litres a minute, remember that 28 kilowatt is our design load. So that's calculated at minus two degrees outside temperature. So at worst case, the boiler is gonna be running at a maximum of 20 litres a minute and the system side running at 20 litres a minute also. The minute we get a TRV closed down on this side, that system pump is going to slow down to maintain its pressure output. The minute that happens, this side will be slower than that side. And as I said earlier, that's literally twice as bad as if it was faster than that side. For this reason, Sibsi recommend that the secondary side of a low loss header or, second, or any hydraulic separation is 30% faster than the primary side and Wiesmann recommend targeting a delta T of 15 on the secondary side for radiators for the very same reason. So in that case, we would up this to 26 litres a minute. So again, a bit of distortion, not perfect, but this system's going to run. 
The other problem is we're now all installing modulating boilers. When the temperature is not minus two outside, but actually 11 degrees, your load is only going to be 14 kilowatts. Now remember, it's actually much more likely to be 11 degrees outside than minus two. It's only minus two around 1% of the year. When it's 14 degrees load, your boiler pump is going to run more like 10 liters a minute to maintain delta, to maintain delta T20. So you can see here, now we're running 20, 10 liters a minute here, 26 liters a minute here, distortion again, hotter boiler, less condensing, less efficient heat transfer, etc, etc, etc. The other issue you get here, which I didn't mention earlier on, was that if you've got a maximum flow temperature of here of say 75 degrees, Wiesmann for example, and your mean temperature over here can only get up to 60 degrees, your radiators might not be big enough to heat up the place at minus two at 60 degrees. So a system that may have worked before without a low loss header, the minute you put a low loss header in, it's gonna struggle in winter. What will happen is the boiler will actually get too hot and it won't actually put out its full 28 kilowatts of energy because the emitters are too cool to give the output. This isn't even starting on mentioning the issues you're gonna get if you have multiple pumps on the secondary side. Multiple pumps are a bit elaborate and they'll vary the flow rate so much on the secondary side that you're gonna get all sorts of distortion happening. Now I'm not saying not to use low loss headers at all. My point is it's a tool to be used in a certain circumstance. Just throwing it in for pictures and because you think you're adding efficiency is incorrect. You're not adding efficiency. They cost more. You're gonna to have to buy extra pumps. The low loss header's got to be manufactured. Your customer's gonna to have to pay for additional parts and labor to install it. So these are all the different things you should ask yourself when you're deciding to put in a low loss header or not. The main real only time you have to use a low loss header or any other hydraulic separation is under floor heating. However, what you can do to minimize distortion is have a close couple T. Actually, I'll just draw this, it's gonna be easier. If you've got underfloor heating, usually you've got underfloor heating with radiators. If you have an underfloor heating manifold, if you have an underfloor heating manifold, some underfloor heating manifolds come with hydraulic separation built in. In that case, you can take the flow and return and connect them directly in, and you don't need to worry about hydraulic separation. It's all taken care of in the manifold. However, many don't. In that case, what I would suggest is just putting a close couple T in here. That way you've only got distortion on the underfloor heating circuit and underfloors run at low temperatures anyway and no distortion to the radiators. Less parts, less pumps, less things to go wrong and cheaper to install. Make sure if you're installing close couple T to follow the close couple T rules though. I will be again doing a video on that. If you've got an underfloor heating system without any radiators, you probably are gonna need a low loss header or some other form of hydraulic separation. Unless your underfloor heating system is less than a third of your boiler output. For example, for example in flats. So if you had a 28 kilowatt boiler, what's a third of 28? 9.3 kilowatts. So if we've got a 28 kilowatt boiler here and a nine kilowatt underfloor heating system, this also depends on the boiler you're using. Some boilers you can pick the maximum minimum speeds, less advanced boilers you won't be able to do that on. But the pump will be capable of providing enough flow for a nine kilowatt underfloor heating system to maintain delta T of seven. You just put the pump up to max. So that can literally connect straight onto the underfloor manifold and come back. You don't need all the extra gump, it's even cheaper again. And in fact, really, you may even be able to do up to 14 kilowatts underfloor heating system. If it runs at delta T10, so what? They'd have to have very sensitive toes to notice a couple of extra degrees on one part of the room. And that's only when it's minus two outside. As it gets warmer outside, your delta T will shrink. And in fact, by the time it gets to 11 degrees outside, your delta T will shrink to exactly delta T of five. So again, works out cheaper, in my opinion, more efficient, because you're not putting in metal that doesn't need to be put in. And it's quicker, and it's cheaper for the customer. For me, you're giving more value. So that was my first video in a series I'm gonna be doing called Heat Geek. I'm gonna be covering all sorts of hydraulic stuff like this, modulating controls, uh, best ways to refine your system, um, condensing theory, how much efficiency condensing really adds. We're also gonna be looking into how to size low loss headers, 
and how best to design the pipe work to minimise distortion. Because there's a few little pipe orientations I've figured out that can minimise distortion. Loads of really geeky, sad stuff that most people don't give a shit about. But for the people that do, hit subscribe because I'm going to be giving gold dust. Okay, a little bonus I just want to throw in at the end here that I've just thought of. I saw a video the other day saying that you want to keep the return between 55 and 60 degrees to maximise condensing, which is very misleading. If we say, where's my pen? If we say this is the heat exchanger. If you have 70 degree flow and 55 degrees return, actually let's do that in blue. Look more pretty. That doesn't look more pretty. 55 degrees return, 50 degrees return even. Condensing inside a heat exchanger is exactly the same as the condensate on your windows. The cooler your windows, the more condensing you get. Condensing starts at 54 degrees and the maximum theoretical temperature is 57 degrees. If you've got a boiler with um, uh, mass, flow con mass flow sensors and lambda control, that can really refine the combustion process to lift up that condensing temperature as high as possible. So wherever 57 lies on this heat exchanger, around here, this whole part of the heat exchanger is adding c condensing efficiency. This is out of condensing. And the simple way of explaining how condensing adds efficiency is it extracts latent heat by creating a state change. The minute you get a state change, say from ice to water, water to steam, and vice versa, you get either absorption or release of energy. And when those products of combustion make contact with 57 to 54 or below, you get condensate appearing on on the heat exchanger and energy absorbed in the form of heat. So ideally our aim is to have the whole heat exchanger below 57 degrees. But that's not to say our target's to get the 70 below 57 or 54. Really, we're still focusing on the return temperature because the lower your return temperature and the cooler this part of the heat exchanger, the more condensate can be taken out. There'll always be some vapor blown out of the flue but more vapour will be turned into water the cooler that part of the heat exchanger. So it's not a case of either in condensing or out of condensing. Once you reach condensing, the lower you go below it, the more condensing latent heat you extract. What's more, as the boiler ramps down, the fan's going slower, the products of combustion are going to spend longer time in contact with that heat exchanger, giving more opportunity for condensing and not blowing that heat out of the heat exchanger and improving heat transfer in general. This also leads into modulating controls and why boiler modulation is so important, which again, I'll cover in another video. Guys, I hope you took something valuable here and I'll see you on the next video. Cheers.